Ladies and gentlemen, permit me, please, to claim your attention for a moment. It can only be a moment, for as you know, we are all of us strictly rational. Throughout his life, Winston Churchill was haunted by his early experience of piloting propeller planes that could only maintain speed and height by flying into the wind. From it, he took a metaphor for living, the idea of keeping on flying against resistance inspired Churchill's ferocious will to succeed and his desperate fear of slowing down. To lose momentum, he said, is not merely to stop, but to fall. If you saved your country, arguably saved the world, what do you do for an encore? That was the question confronting Winston Churchill in the summer of 1945. You'd have thought that after his finest hour as Britain's war leader, Churchill would have rested content. But he didn't. Churchill drove on. The story, I think, is quite extraordinary. And I believe it brings us much closer to the human being behind the national. Churchill refused to slide gracefully into a tranquil old age. Sidelined by electoral defeat, he returned to centre stage as a world statesman. He fought his way back to the prime ministership, reinventing himself as a man of peace. And as an epic chronicler of the Second World War, he deliberately went about sealing his own place in history. What's more, he did all this in his 70s, punctuated by two serious strokes. Here was a man who had to keep on going because he could not stand still, whose overwhelming sense of his place in history compelled him to try to shape the future and rewrite the past, and whose furious determination to stay so long at top flying speed imposed almost unbearable strains on his whole family. If we want to understand this richly complex character, we need to look at Churchill's forgotten years after 1945. over London, the fortress of freedom in the dark days, millions rejoice in final and complete victory after a war lasting nearly six years. On VE Day, May 1945, Winston Churchill was cheered through the streets by ecstatic Londoners. He had led his country from the brink of defeat in 1940 to total victory over Adolf Hitler. The German war is therefore at an end. Advance Britannia! Victory was was wonderful. But already I, I sensed a feeling of um, tremendous anxiety and foreboding. The difficulties of the post-war period began to be so enormous and they were already clouding the hour of victory. With the war over, it was back to politics as usual. In July 1945, the British people would go to the polls to elect their first post-war government. As the campaign began, it was clear that Churchill's rhetoric was out of tune 
with the new mood of reform. In his first election broadcast, Churchill made the astonishing claim that Labour would employ a secret police to curtail free speech. No socialist government conducting the entire life and industry of the country could afford to allow free, sharp or violently worded expressions of public discontent. They would have to fall back on some form of Gestapo, no doubt very humanely directed. In this scaremongering about a Labour Gestapo alienated many floating voters and was deeply offensive to Labour supporters. They were angry, but also they were hysterically amused by it because it was such obvious claptrap and extremely damaging to Winston to make that sort of statement. People that he was addressing and speaking to, in a sense, seemed not to be the same sort of people, people he talked to in the, in the war over the radio who were, were waiting to hear what he said and who were seeking guidance. Well, uh... Churchill even faced hecklers. Now, I dare say there are some here who are afraid to hear my word. You better listen, because you'll find it interesting. And understand that Mr. Morrison has said... Uh, ...has made a, a statement Churchill, I think, hoped that people would be grateful, as they should have been, for a great victory, and would vote, in a sense, gratefully. There's no gratitude in politics. Nineteen forty-five was a strange election. Hundreds of thousands of voters were far across the seas serving with British forces in Europe and Asia. So it took three weeks from polling day until the votes were counted. During that time, Churchill remained Prime Minister and a commanding figure in world politics. At Potsdam, in the heart of defeated Germany, he immersed himself in the final Big Three conference of the war. Yet after a week of talks, Churchill had to return home to await the verdict of the electorate. Back in England for the election results, Mr. Churchill and his daughter arrive at a British airfield where Mrs. Churchill greets them. Conservative central office was still predicting a majority of over 80 seats. But in the early hours of Thursday the 26th of July, Churchill's confidence was abruptly shaken. Just before dawn, I woke suddenly with a sharp stab of almost physical pain. A hitherto subconscious conviction that we were beaten broke forth and dominated my mind. All the pressure of great events on and against which I had mentally so long maintained my flying speed would cease and I should fall. As the election results came in and were posted up in the war room annex, it became clear that Churchill's premonition had been uncannily accurate. Public opinion had swung to the left. Churchill was seen as the right leader for the war, the wrong man for the peace. This wasn't just a defeat. I think that Churchill, steeped as he was in British history, knew it was a total humiliation. That day, the Churchill family lunched in silence, almost choking on their food. Winston's wife, Clementine, did her best to cheer up her husband. Aware that he was exhausted from five years as prime minister, she said, well, Perhaps it is a blessing in disguise. Churchill looked at her and growled. At the moment, it is quite effectively disguised. It was sensational. 
Three weeks ago or more, when you recorded your votes, very few of you would have prophesied a working majority for Labour, much less one of about 200 seats. Next day, Churchill held a final sombre cabinet meeting at number 10. 30 years of my life have been passed in this room, he told his foreign secretary, Anthony Eden. I shall never sit in it again. You will, but I shall not. Churchill had lost not only his job, but his whole way of life. His map room was empty, his private secretaries had gone, and there were no more red boxes full of top secret messages from around the world. The shock was almost physical. After five years at the heart of government, Churchill was suddenly cut off from the arteries of power. Evicted from number 10, he was also temporarily homeless. His successor, Clement Attlee, generously lent him the Prime Minister's country retreat, Chequers, for a final sad weekend. We were really in despair. He was seen so plunged in gloom. Sarah thought of playing gramophone records. So we started with um, Gilbert and Sullivan, which usually cheered him up, but no reaction. However, French and American war marches that aroused him a little bit and started perhaps walking around. But the thing that really cheered him up was a wonderful um, crazy gang song, you know, Run, Rabbit, Run. Run, run, run rabbit, run, rabbit, run, 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 run. Next evening, there was a final dinner, a kind of wake, which the family got through only with the help of a good deal of champagne. Run, run, rabbit, run, rabbit, run. At the end, Churchill asked each of them to sign the Chequers Visitors Book. He added his name last, and under it wrote a single word, Phoenix. It really did seem to be all over. Five years of unremitting burden as Prime Minister had taken their toll on Churchill. Exhausted, he was now suddenly thrown back into a family life he had taken for granted. He and his wife, Clementine, soon began to bicker, as she recorded in a letter to her daughter, Mary. I cannot explain how it is, but in our misery, we seem, instead of clinging to each other, to be always having scenes. I'm sure it's all my fault but I'm finding life more than I can bear. He is so unhappy, and that makes him very difficult. She was quite sure he ought to retire now, and that anything else would be such a falling away. And I think it was very much colored also by her own actual physical and um, nervous fatigue. For nearly 40 years, Clementine had sacrificed her career to his. A woman of great intelligence and perception, she had made Winston, as she said, her life's work. It was a full-time job, because Winston was totally undomesticated. And he was also a man of extravagant moods, sometimes charming and loquacious, at others sulky and brusque, usually absorbed in himself. Churchill's family lived in the shadow of his greatness. The marriage of his eldest daughter, Diana, was in trouble, but Churchill's relations with her remained distant. He had a closer rapport with his second daughter, Sarah, but felt deep misgivings about her chosen career, acting. Nicknamed Mule for her stubborn nature, 
she had also defied her father to marry the music hall comedian, Vic Oliver. Hello, everybody. First of all, I want to tell you how happy I am to be back here in India again. From whom she was divorced in 1945. But the relationship that caused Churchill most unhappiness was with his troubled son, Randall. My father was not an easy man. Uh, and I think he quite clearly found it very difficult being the only son of Winston Churchill. When they were together, it wasn't very long before they would have humdingers of rows. It reached a pitch in uh, the early part of the war when my grandmother uh, banned my father from Downing Street and said, uh, Randolph, uh, you will never set foot in this house so long as the war continues. You'll give your father a heart attack. Churchill felt great affection for his children, but he found it very difficult to engage with their problems on any deep emotional level. In war and politics, he confronted crises head on. But on the home front, his instinct was to escape. Relief in September 1945 came through one of his favorite generals, Sir Harold Alexander, as British commander in post-war Italy, had requisitioned a villa on Lake Como and invited Churchill to come for a visit. Churchill was a man of many parts. Back in 1915, in order to relax, he'd learned to paint, and he found it totally absorbing. He'd picked up his brushes only once during the Second World War, but now he did so again. He explained to his friend and doctor Charles Moran. With my painting, I have recovered my balance. I'm damn glad to be out of it. I shall paint for the rest of my days. I've never painted so well before. His appetite for life was returning he wrote to Clementine. This is the first time for very many years that I have been completely out of the world. I feel a great sense of relief, which grows steadily, others having to face the hideous problems of the aftermath. It may all indeed be a blessing in disguise. Churchill was 70, and the thought of retirement must have crossed his mind. But not, I think, for long. His was an ever-restless ego. There always seemed more to be done, because throughout his life, Churchill was repeatedly gnawed by doubt as to what he had really achieved. A kind of quivering insecurity behind that bulldog exterior. The defeat of 1945 seemed a very personal rejection and Churchill yearned for vindication. Como was seductive. It was probably the moment Churchill came closest to bowing out and putting his feet up. But it was an unreal moment. Churchill was Churchill and he had to keep on flying. In 1940, Churchill had been the voice of embattled Britain. But in the 1945 election campaign, he found that, as he said sadly, I have no message for them. As he returned from Italy to his new home in Kensington, 
Churchill sought an opportunity to put himself back on the map as a world statesman. Among a huge pile of invitations to speak, one caught his attention. It was from a minor American college in the back of beyond, but scribbled at the bottom was a message from the President of the United States. This is a wonderful school in my home state. Hope you can do it. I'll introduce you. Best regards, Harry S. Truman. This was the kind of chance that Churchill had been waiting for. For months, he brooded over the fate of Eastern Europe under Soviet domination. Now out of power and not constrained by diplomatic protocol, he felt able to speak out. That was how, in March 1946, Winston Churchill came to be traveling in the company of the President of the United States to a small town in the rural American Midwest, Fulton, Missouri. They got to the edge of the town, and then suddenly Churchill asked the driver to stop. And nobody knew why. He fiddled around in his pockets, and then finally pulled out the cigar. He clamped it in his mouth, and then told them to carry on. The cigar was Churchill's hallmark, part of that image of bulldog defiance that he had projected around the world in 1940. He was attentive to this image, even down to the smallest detail. And today was no small day, because Winston Churchill knew he was about to give one of the biggest speeches of his political career. Ironically, a small college gymnasium provided the platform for what would be one of the defining moments of the new Cold War. Mr. Churchill and I believe in freedom of speech. And it's one of the great privileges of my lifetime to be able to present to you that great world citizen, Winston Churchill. The big point Churchill wanted to make was the need for Britain and America to cooperate in peace as they had done during the war. But what caused a stir was why they had to cooperate the deepening menace, as he saw it, of Stalin's Russia. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. It was the phrase Iron Curtain that hit the headlines. And what gave it such power was the fact that the President of the United States was sitting beside him. This was classic Churchill. Opportunist, provocative, and prophetic. The reaction in Moscow was explosive. Stalin hit back in person with an amazing denunciation of Churchill for preaching Anglo-American world domination in the style of Hitler's racial supremacy. Churchill had stirred up a storm once again, and he was delighted to be flying straight into it. With the Iron Curtain speech, Churchill had once more shown he was a man of ideas, and there were more to come. Back in the old world, with speeches in Zurich and The Hague, he preached the goal of a United States of Europe. This may not seem so novel now, but at the time, shortly after the Second World War, and with much of Europe still in ruins, it was a revolutionary idea. I'm now going to say something that will astonish you. The first step in the recreation of the European family must be a partnership between France and Germany. 
In this way only can France recover... Deep in him was this feeling that another world war would finish as a nation. And that, I think, led him, and as it leads some of us now, to feel that whatever the obstacles, whatever the objections to a more united Europe, nothing could be worse than 1914, 18, 1939, 45. And so Churchill became a somewhat unlikely patron of the new European movement. He gave a rousing speech to inaugurate the Council of Europe in Strasbourg. Place Kleber, which is a very large public square, was packed with at least 10,000 people. And Winston came out onto the balcony and started as follows. Citoyen, a citoyen de Strasbourg. Renegade, je vais parler français. And they roared with laughter. They'd never heard a politician make a joke before. There was a downside to these great rhetorical triumphs. Fulton suggested that Churchill was an aggressive cold warrior. Strasbourg implied that Britain would be at the heart of a new Europe. These impressions would create problems for Churchill in the future. But what mattered at the time, I think, was that Churchill had put the Gestapo broadcast firmly behind him. Iron Curtain, United Europe, these were phrases that echoed around the world. They showed that Churchill was once again master of the soundbite. And they also proved that he was a man of the future as well as the past. In short, Winston had found his voice once again. Back in Britain, Churchill had also found a new cause. The Labour government was bent on nationalisation and Churchill was determined to fight them. He told Moran, I'm going to stay and have them out. I'll tear their bleeding entrails out of them. But Churchill's political comeback created friction with his colleagues in the Conservative Party. Privately, many senior Tories had hoped he would retire as party leader. But such was his standing at the end of the war that they dared not give him the push. And his foreign affairs spokesman and heir apparent, Anthony Eden, was too soft to wield the knife. Under Mr. Churchill's leadership, we can accept the challenge. It cannot come too soon. I remember now there was a famous moment when somebody, some newspaper said they thought he was past it. And he then, it wouldn't work now, he arranged to go out hunting. He wore a very strange hat and was photographed, certainly, seated on a horse. And this was designed to show people that he was um, young at heart, anyway. <laughs> but Churchill didn't enjoy the routine of leader of the opposition. So he bamboozled Eden into doing the daily grind in the Commons, while he, Winston, hogged the limelight with big, set speeches. Churchill had a natural circle of political friends, and he was not inclined to enlarge it. He preferred old cronies, like the press baron Lord Beaverbrook, instead of new faces in the Westminster Tea Room. And he did his business in congenial settings, like the pinafore room of the Savoy Hotel. Here he engaged in what he most enjoyed as leader of the opposition, long lunches at which he could harangue his shadow cabinet. He wasn't particularly interested in the detail of domestic politics, nor 
Strange though it may seem, was he very good at small talk. If he had to take lunch or tea with a group of unfamiliar backbench MPs, he could often do so in almost complete silence. Churchill was always a bit of a loner. Although a political giant, he was not a natural politician. In any case, Churchill had more important things to occupy him than political gossip. Although triumphant in 1945 as war leader, he now found his record was in question. The attack came in a series of best-selling American war memoirs. The one that irritated him most was by Elliot Roosevelt, the son of the dead American president. It was full of barbs, supposedly from FDR, about Churchill as an old-fashioned imperialist, and criticism of his supposed reluctance to mount a second front against Hitler-dominated France. In August 1946, Lord Moran found Churchill in the studio at Chartwell, busy with his painting. He stood back and surveyed the easel. Elliot Roosevelt has been writing a foolish book. It attacks me. I don't care what he says. He's not much of a fellow. Churchill's manner was one of lofty, almost absent-minded disdain. His eyes remained glued to the canvas. But it was clear that the criticism had got under his skin. Churchill had a keen sense of historical reputation. Often he would say when locked in political controversy, all right, I shall leave it to history, but remember that I shall be one of the historians. And so the words poured forth. Churchill had a preferred pattern of work. After a good dinner, fortified and lubricated, he would go up to his study at Chartwell for several hours of dictation to his secretary. He paced up and down the room, sometimes talking slowly, sometimes in great torrents, occasionally taking a swig from a tumbler of watered-down whiskey, mouthwash, as he liked to call it. If perhaps, you know, it was four in the morning, and you went to bed and he'd say things like, oh, what time, what time will you get up again? So he would say, well, would you like to dictate early in the morning? Oh, I would. Well, I could be here at nine. Oh, could you? You know, of course I could. <laughs> His flow of memories was prompted by drafts, background narratives written by a remarkable group of research assistants on episodes like the fall of France or the desert victories. Churchill wove these into his own story. He would work on the selected material which I gave him. And from that, he would dictate his own story. And uh, this became an intense routine for a long time. And uh, you would suddenly see things in a completely different light. The official records were not important. What was important was his memory. He was the history. Between 1948 and 1954, Churchill published six volumes of memoirs, nearly two million words, an astonishing amount of work. It was testimony to his single-minded sense of purpose, to his whole philosophy of life. He said, before my head hits the pillow each night, I invigilate myself. What have I achieved today? Have I written an article? Have I 
prepared a speech? Have I broken the back of a chapter of a new book? Uh, because if I haven't achieved something concrete, it would be like going to bed without brushing one's teeth. One big aim of all this hard work was to answer his American critics. In his volume, Their Finest Hour, he set out in detail his support, even in 1940, for Mulberry Harbors and landing craft, to suggest that in the darkest hour of the war, he was planning D-Day four years later. Churchill peppered the memoirs with government documents, such as his minutes to ministers, or his telegrams to Roosevelt and Stalin. The documents, carefully edited, helped Churchill's interpretation appear as something like the authorized version. So what should we make of Churchill's memoirs today? He provided some unique snapshots of wartime meetings, particularly with Roosevelt and Stalin, stories we'd never have got from any other source. But there are huge gaps. The Eastern Front, for instance. Stalingrad gets only four pages, spread over two widely separated chapters. Yet that was the turning point of the war in Europe. So this is a very partial view of the conflict. Churchill himself called it only a contribution to history. But because of all those authoritative documents and well-researched drafts, it conveyed the impression of being definitive. And what's fascinating is the way that its very language has shaped Britain's whole sense of national identity. Phrases such as their finest hour chimed in with people's understanding of the war and its significance. In words now, as well as deeds then, Churchill had truly taken command of history. By the late 1940s, Churchill had made a spectacular recovery from the disaster of July 1945. He'd regained his flying speed. Once more, the family were caught up in his slipstream. Clementine accepted her husband's determination to stay in public life, but the strain on her was immense, and she often needed to recuperate with time at a sanatorium. It wasn't just the physical burden of coping with Winston. She also had a very real fear of my father suddenly failing in public or something like that. Clementine was very conscious of her husband's status as a national figure. She was always worried by the flip side of Winston's workaholic lifestyle, his need to indulge in food, drink and exotic company. But whatever Clemmy felt, Churchill loved to let go and revel in the high life of the French Riviera. I suppose after so many years doing nothing but politics and writing and speeches and effort. It was uh, a release to find himself in this rather r raffish world. While Mr. Churchill was on holiday at Monte Carlo, he spent a good deal of his time painting at Cap Dai. In August 1949, he stayed near Monaco at La Caponcina, the villa of his friend, Lord Beaverbrook. Marlowe Braun, the film star, very beautiful, very, very pretty, very grand, was a guest of Lord Beaverbrook's. And she spent a lot of time standing behind Mr. Churchill, watching him paint. And he loved pretty women, you know, he was very conscious of pretty women. Churchill spent August the 23rd bathing with the Hollywood star. He even turned a few somersaults in the sea to amuse her. 
but he was now 74, and age was finally beginning to catch up with him. To the outside world, Churchill seemed splendidly robust. But that night, playing cards, he did something most unusual. Without saying a word, and I think quite unconsciously, he removed from his right hand his father's ring, which he had worn continuously since inheriting it. At 2 a.m., getting up from the card table, he began to feel cramp in that right hand and also in his right leg. Something very frightening was happening. Churchill's doctor, Lord Moran, was summoned from London. He arrived with his golf clubs to avoid arousing the press who were camped outside the gate of La Caponcina. Moran examined Churchill carefully. A very small clot has blocked a very small artery, he said reassuringly. In other words, Churchill had suffered a minor stroke. But a fraction over, and the clot would have stopped the flow of blood to his brain. He was alone in his room, and he said to me, what are you going to do this evening? Which really set me back, because never <laughs> ever asked anything like that before and he was lisping slightly. And I just felt, I felt so unhappy about it all because, you know, it was some, something one had never seen before of him in a weakened position. The dagger has struck, Churchill said. But this time it was not plunged in to the hilt. And what was his response? True to character, it was not to slow down but to speed up. Churchill threw himself back into British politics, which were also picking up speed. In February 1950, the country would go to the polls again. Well then, we'll all try our best to make England in the forefront of the nations of the world. Despite his stroke, Churchill worked hard on the campaign. Scene four, take one. The conservative and national liberal parties set in the forefront of their policy. Scene three, take one. Under the socialist system. Scene seven, take one. Right. Where are we now? Mr. Churchill, scene nine, take one. Scene six, take one. Wait a moment. We are the chosen few. I can't remember it, should you? I've right. got one of the best memories you can have. I know, sir, but that's quite all right. Off. Quite all right. Hmm? Don't worry. Look at the camera and start again, sir. We are the chosen few. All of you will be damned. There is no place in heaven for you. We can't have heaven crammed. <laughs> I thought it was a muting quotation I read this morning. But Labour just won the election, scraping back to power with an overall majority of five. But final results confirmed that Labour had a narrow majority. As a hastily summoned cabinet meeting... The narrowness of Churchill's defeat made him determined to have one more try. It also made it hard for the Tory party to move him on. Cheering crowds greeted Mr. Attlee as he left... Under Churchill's leadership, the Tories exerted huge pressure in Parliament, tiring out an already exhausted Labour government. And we kept them up late, we harassed them. Uh, we made no secret of this. I can remember... You know, we keep ministers up till two or three in the morning. And Attlee was in hospital with a duodenal ulcer. And that was where the curtains, I think. In October 1951, Attlee was forced to call another election. As the results came in, Churchill knew that he would be returning to Downing Street this time 
as the people's choice. The victory, he told Beaverbrook, was our revenge for 1945. It was an impressive political comeback for a man who was nearly 77. In fact, things had turned out a lot better for Churchill than if he'd won in 1945. Because I doubt that he could have physically survived being Prime Minister much longer after five unrelenting years of war. And his stature would also have been diminished by having to preside over Britain's post-war economic crisis and the country's rapid decline as a world power. Instead, Churchill had used his second wilderness years to entrench himself in Tory politics, cement his reputation as war leader, and promote himself as a truly world statesman. So Clementine had been right. 1945 did indeed prove a blessing in disguise. But it was no blessing for Clementine, who frankly dreaded his return to power. On top of looking after Winston, she faced the renewed burden of political entertaining. But Churchill was, of course, delighted by his victory. It was like picking up his finest hour all over again. And in many ways, he was a backward-looking prime minister. His cabinet included several old war horses, figures like Field Marshal Alexander and General Ismay, often in posts for which they were not really suited. Harold Macmillan is in charge of housing and local government, and back to the Foreign Office comes Anthony Eden. He is also Deputy Premier. May good fortune attend the new cabinet and the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. Churchill was no longer very interested in domestic affairs and was bored by financial detail. Even in foreign policy, he disliked novelties, moaning on one occasion, I have lived 78 years without hearing about bloody places like Cambodia. And his eccentricities seemed exaggerated by old age. I remember on one occasion, I was going up and I met uh, Anthony Eden and the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rab Butler, also going up. And they said, uh, it's important and urgent that we see the Prime Minister at once. So I went into the room and he was scribbling away at, at his notes. And uh, I said, the Chancellor of the Exchequer and the Foreign Secretary need to see you immediately. They say it's important, or words to that effect. And he said, tell them to go and bugger themselves. And then, uh, in a loud voice, there is no need for them to carry out that instruction, literally. <laughs> and the t when I went outside, they were just outside. They obviously heard it. They looked pained. With his powers waning, Churchill's moods could vary dramatically. His impatience when orders were not met promptly was to fly into terrifying rages. And it was as if something flew off the top of his head. The steam pushed the, uh, his patience out of control. And the best way of dealing with it for him was to shout. So once that was off his chest, then he was back to his relaxed mood. Churchill often hinted that he would stay only a few months longer and then hand over to Anthony Eden. But he was also convinced that there was work that only he could do as Prime Minister. He was determined to rebuild a close bond with the United States, which he believed had been eroded under Attlee. The phrase, special relationship, was another of Churchill's great slogans, and one that continues to define British foreign policy to the present day. Almost his first act as Prime Minister was to arrange a meeting with President Truman. And having, through your vast strength, 
brought peace and hope and salvation on earth to struggling mankind. Peace on earth is what we're both striving for. Thank you, sir. He also cultivated Truman's successor, Dwight Eisenhower. Churchill's devotion to the special relationship was not just sentimental nostalgia. It was also a means to an end. Side by side, Britain and America could deal with the Soviet Union from a position of strength. As he declared at Fulton back in 1946, Churchill believed it essential that the West should not just contain the Soviets, but also try and negotiate with them. Increasingly, this search for dialogue with Moscow gave his premiership a sense of purpose and direction. And why was he so keen on talking with the Russians? Because of the deepening menace of the nuclear age. Churchill was appalled at the devastating power of the new hydrogen bomb. Churchill had been trained as a man of war. He'd taken part in the last great British cavalry charge at Omdurman in 1898. His feel for war was something unique that he brought to Britain's great crisis in 1940. But this was not war as Churchill had experienced it. It was now waged by chemists in spectacles and chauffeurs pulling the levers of aeroplanes or machine guns. War which used to be cruel and magnificent, has now become cruel and squalid. After reading reports of H-bomb tests, Churchill commented that the world was now as far from the age of the atom bomb as the atom bomb had been from that of the bow and arrow. Churchill set about refashioning himself as a man of peace. He proposed a new conference of the leaders of the great powers, and he coined a new word for it, a summit. The model was his frenetic shuttle diplomacy during the Second World War. For Churchill, history was an epic made by great men, in blood on the field of battle, or in words across the conference table. Often he thought back to that heady moment in the Kremlin late on the 9th of October, 1944. That's when he and Stalin made a spheres of influence arrangement about countries such as Greece, Romania, and Yugoslavia. Churchill set it out on a piece of paper in terms of percentages and pushed the paper across the table. Stalin listened to the translation, paused, and then took out his blue pencil and made a big tick in the right-hand corner. In a few moments, they had divided the Balkans between them. People at the top can do these things, Churchill liked to say. Others cannot. But in the 1950s, the Foreign Secretary, Anthony Eden, and his American counterpart, John Foster Dulles, were much less keen on holding a great power summit and an aged Stalin was not receptive. Initially, Churchill made little progress. Yet in the spring of 1953, it seemed that his moment had finally come. In March, Stalin died. Eden was then in hospital because of a gallbladder operation, and Churchill assumed control of the Foreign Office. In May, he was free to unveil his plan in a major speech to the House of Commons. The conference should be confined to the smallest number of powers and persons possible. It should meet with a measure of informality and a still greater measure of privacy and seclusion. At the worst, the participants in the meeting would have established more intimate contacts. At the best, we might have a generation of peace. 
Churchill thought he was on the brink of success, but fate intervened. On Tuesday the 23rd of June, he hosted a dinner for the Italian Prime Minister. As the evening was coming to a close, Churchill slumped in his chair. They put too much on me. Foreign affairs, he groaned. The guests were ushered out and he was helped upstairs to bed. Lord Moran diagnosed another stroke, far more severe than 1949. When my father left number 10 that afternoon to get into his car to drive to Chartwell, he was walking. When he got to Chartwell, the other end, he had to be almost carried out of the car. He got steadily worse, his speech went, and his movement on his left-hand side went, and he remained in bed for the Friday. Lord Moran told my mother and told us that they, he didn't think he would live the weekend. Churchill's trusted private secretary, Jock Colville, wrote to the Prime Minister's closest friends. There is a possibility of a miraculous change within the next 48 hours, but it is unlikely, I'm afraid. He thinks of resigning in the near future. Yet Churchill's spirit remained indomitable. He immediately started occupying his mind and he decided he would like to read the political novels of Trollope. And so he started with Phineas Finn and on he went. And it was amazing the pace he read. And by the end of the weekend, on the Monday, Lord Moran said, I think he's going to make it. He did recover quite quickly after that. I remember being with him one weekend and there was a little stool he put his hands beside his, beside his side and jumped two feet up onto it and, and said, not bad for a man who's had a bad stroke. Uh, it, it, and it wasn't. It was astonishing. But Lord Moran knew that from now on, his brain could be short of blood. He was really living on a volcano, and he may get another stroke at any time. Fortunately for Churchill, Parliament was in recess for the summer. He could recuperate at Chequers and Chartwell without public appearances. And his loyal staff and newspaper barons like Beaverbrook conspired to cover up the story from the public. But could he convince his party that he was still fit to lead the country? Churchill's target became the Conservative Conference in October. It would be make or break for him as Prime Minister. I can only describe our feeling as being numb with anxiety. We were willing him to get through that speech. Uh, a few years ago, nationalisation was, among socialists, the cure-all for social and economic difficulties. Now, keep this to yourself, that there is a, a very general feeling that it is an utter flop. I remember going round to the green room after the speech, thinking I may well see somebody who's totally exhausted by this occasion. Not at all, he was sitting there and he was renewed. It was a victory. Churchill had made another astonishing comeback, but at a cost. It's no exaggeration, I think, to say that Churchill's family life was a mess. And in the process of recovery from the stroke, things got even worse. Clementine, in particular, who'd borne so much of the burden of his determination to stay in politics, was now ill and exhausted. 
If in public she seemed a woman of total poise, yet in private she was at times on the edge of hysteria. And because of her absorption with Winston, she often had little emotional energy to spare for her children. Relations remained especially fragile with her daughter Diana, who suffered a complete nervous breakdown that same year. Churchill must have been aware of this, yet he chose to turn a blind eye. Despite the cost to his family, his needs, as always, came first. At root, I think, Churchill just wanted, as he put it, to stay in the pub until closing time. But he had to persuade his cabinet and the country that this was a matter of idealism and not just self-interest. And to be convincing, he had to persuade himself as well. One word, personally, about myself. If I stay on for the time being, bearing the burden at my age, it is not because of love for power or office. I have had an ample share of both. If I stay, it is because I have a feeling that I may, through things that have happened, have an influence on what I care about above all else, the building of a sure and lasting peace. Arranging a summit was both a reason and an excuse to stay on. But by 1954, his cabinet colleagues had had enough. And above all, his heir apparent, Anthony Eaton, whose nerves had become more and more frayed by waiting for Churchill to go. Papa thought Anthony was trying to hustle him. And Anthony Eaton thought my father was hanging on too long. And I, he wasn't alone in that opinion. It was almost the stuff of a Shakespearean tragedy. The old king still centre stage. The not so young pretender kicking his heels in the wings. I do remember the occasion when, once when I overheard him saying to Eden, you're very young, you're under 60. Why do you look at me with hungry eyes? In July 1954, Churchill unilaterally sent a telegram to the new Soviet leaders, again proposing a summit. His ministers were furious that he'd gone behind their backs. At last, they faced him down in the cabinet room. Lord Salisbury said that Churchill had flouted the conventions of cabinet government. Harold Macmillan backed him up. When Churchill denied this, a furious Eden joined the attack. In turn, with sorrow or anger, each member of the cabinet plunged in the knife. A tragic situation, wrote Macmillan in his diary. All of us who have really loved as well as admired him are being slowly driven into something like hatred. Flying into the storm yet again, the resistance finally brought Churchill crashing to earth. But it took his family to make him let go of the controls. My mother thought my father should resign in 45. Still more did she think he shouldn't have become prime minister in 51. So by the time it came to 54, 55, she was, couldn't be more in earnest about him retiring. In April 1955, Churchill gave in. But he needed a spectacular exit. A special dinner was arranged for the Queen at 10 Downing Street. The following day, he tendered his resignation at Buckingham Palace. It was what his wife, Clementine, had so desperately wanted. But she saw how hard he took it. Retirement, she said, was for him a death in life. 
For a decade, Churchill had been driven by his search for vindication after the defeat of 1945. And even more profoundly by his fear of stopping and therefore falling, the impulse that animated his whole life. Churchill had to keep on flying high as a politician, an orator, a writer, and a statesman. Yet now, he told his Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rad Butler, I feel like an aeroplane at the end of its flight, in the dusk, with the petrol running out, looking for a safe landing. When he retired in 1955, Churchill was not just a national icon. His fame was truly global. Across the world, streets were named after him, statues erected in his honor. In 1953, he had been awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. I ask you now to accept on behalf of your husband the 1953 Nobel Prize for Literature from the hand of His Majesty the King. Which Clementine collected on his behalf. And there would also be living memorials. A new college bearing his name at Cambridge University. He seemed to have become enshrined as the greatest living Englishman. But Churchill remained surprisingly insecure about his place in history. And an alarming sign of how he might look to future generations appeared in the official portrait painted by the artist Graham Sutherland for his 80th birthday. This was a gift from Parliament, presented with full pageantry. I well remember the splendid occasion uh, in Westminster Hall when the whole parliament was assembled, uh, lords and commons alike, to make this uh, presentation. And uh, there was sort of a gasp when it was unveiled. <laughs> My grandfather, tongue in cheek, he said, a remarkable example of modern art. The portrait is a remarkable example of modern art. <laughs> it was in sickly tones of yellow and green, and uh, he's slumped back in his armchair, and there's a hint of an undone fly button. His actual remark was, God's teeth, I look like a drunk who'd been fished out of the gutter in the Strand. Churchill developed a deep aversion to the Sutherland portrait. So much so that his wife had it secretly destroyed. This sensitivity over his image was just a foretaste of arguments to come. Churchill was obsessed with how he would go down in history, how he rated alongside Britain's other great leaders from the past. Why did reputation matter so much to Winston Churchill? Because it was the only form of immortality that he could imagine. Death he could face, but not oblivion. Churchill wasn't a religious man. He didn't have faith in any kind of eternal life. He believed he could live on only through his reputation. In the 1940s, Churchill had hit back at his American critics through his war memoirs. In the 1950s, the attack came from nearer home. It was almost a stab in the back. Viscount Allenbrook had been Churchill's top military advisor for most of the war. Allenbrook resented the fact that Churchill had made little mention of him and the chiefs of staff in the war memoirs. Churchill sometimes gave the impression that he'd won the war single-handed, and he'd also made a fortune from his account, whereas Allenbrook, in retirement, was now strapped for cash, forcing him to move out of his country house and into the gardener's cottage. So Allenbrook collaborated with the popular historian Sir Arthur Bryant 
and in 1957 and 1959 published two volumes from his wartime diaries. Alan Brooks' diaries, often used as a kind of safety valve for pent-up frustration, revealed a very different Churchill from the self-portrait in the war memoirs. At times almost a figure of fun. Alan Brooke described Churchill in the surf at Alamein, rolled over by the waves, coming up doing a V sign with his legs, or wandering round his bedroom in his silk underwear, looking rather like Humpty Dumpty. But there was a darker side to Alan Brooke's story. He presented the Prime Minister as a difficult, sometimes unpleasant person to work for. Petulant, erratic, sometimes totally misguided. Jumping on one strategic hobby horse and then suddenly abandoning it for another. This was a truly alternative history of Winston's war. Bryant and Allenbrook did attempt to present the story in a balanced way. And those peaches, yes, yes. and his bulldog determination, they brought out everything that was wanted at that time in this country. He was always determined to hit back, wasn't he? Always determined to hit back, and always determined never to give way. Yes. And that's what made him a little bit difficult to argue with. Yes, of course, I quite understand that. But when excerpts from the books were serialised, they naturally focused only on the more unflattering aspects. Churchill, of course, had to retaliate. The next round in the battle for reputation would be the official biography. For years, he'd intended that someone should chronicle his life and achievements. Who better to do it than his own son, Randolph? This was official biography as family history. Back in 1906, Winston had published a passionate defence of his father, Lord Randolph Churchill, whose meteoric political career had burnt out early in failure and disgrace. Winston had idolised his father, but had virtually no relationship with him. And there is a bizarre but revealing story he wrote about his abiding sense of loss. Churchill was at Chartwell, painting a copy of his father's portrait one foggy November afternoon. Suddenly, he felt a presence in the room. Swinging round, he saw his father watching him from the red leather armchair. Lord Randolph wanted to know what had happened since his death in 1895. So Winston began to relate the cataclysmic events of the 20th century. World wars, devastated cities, millions of dead. His father was horrified. When I hear you talk, Winston, I really wonder you didn't go into politics. You might have done a lot to help. You might even have made a name for yourself. Lord Randolph smiled benignly, but then vanished. Winston had lost his opportunity to explain to his father his own heroic role in the epic of the 20th century. Once again, father and son had reached out, but failed to meet. Only a dream, of course, but still a painful mirror of reality. This mismatch of father and son was replayed with a new twist in the next generation. Winston's son, Randolph, was a man of prodigious talent, but he lacked Winston's persistence and application. Now in his late forties, he had tried desperately to follow in his father's footsteps, but he failed to make his mark in journalism or in parliament. And tragically, this may have been Winston's fault. I think that my grandfather, looking back to his relationship with his father, was determined not to have that sort of relationship with his only son. And so he went 
overboard the other way. He indulged him. Uh, from the age of 12 or 13, my father was expected to attend men-only dinners at Chartwell, while all the great political figures of the day would be assembled around my grandfather's table. And a young Randolph was expected to take part in the conversation and offer opinions. And this very quickly bred in him uh, an incredible arrogance. Could we now go back to your early days when you were nurtured in a political home? Did you have from those early days the intention of going into politics? Oh, yes, I did very early indeed. Um, indeed, when I was 16 and 17, I thought I should be eternally disgraced if I wasn't a member of Parliament by the time I was 21 and Prime Minister by the time I was 25. And that was the problem. And it was that indulgence that effectively destroyed their relationship. The official biography was Randolph's last chance. He was almost pathetically grateful to be entrusted with the commission. And he got down to it at Stour House in Suffolk, his own version of Chartwell. It was an extraordinary place in which to live. Winston was everywhere. Uh, the bookshelves were crammed with, with Churchilliana. Statues, drawings, paintings of Winston were on, were on the walls, photographs of Winston. In middle age, Randolph had finally found his life's work. But the opportunity came too late. Randolph was a chain smoker, often getting through 80 to 100 cigarettes a day. And his addiction to whiskey ravaged his liver and wrecked his heart. Winston had used tobacco and alcohol for promoting his image, but Randolph let that image destroy him. He would only complete two of the eventual eight volumes before succumbing to a massive heart attack. Even in death, Winston proved too much for him. Winston was such a gigantic personality and had so many facets to his life. I think Randolph really couldn't cope with it. Family remained Churchill's great support and yet also his Achilles heel. Winston in retirement was no less demanding and Clementine was now suffering from acute neuritis. For several years, she was in severe pain. Churchill's daughter Diana had divorced, and her mental health was fragile. And Sarah's stage career had faltered, and she turned increasingly to drink. I, I can't remember, even uh, if shows haven't been always professionally successful, I've, I've been tremendously happy in the theatre. Thank and you. I feel very safe behind my cardboard. This could cause strains within the Churchill family. Winston tended to regard such hospitality almost as a right, 
whereas Clementine, more puritanical by nature, often felt like a social parasite. And she was always a bit suspicious, perhaps even jealous, of Winston's closest friends. When London gossip had it that the increasingly frail old man was infatuated by his elegant hostess, Wendy Reeves, Clementine, vigilant as ever for Winston's reputation, made sure that the Reeves were frozen out. Yet ironically, his new host would be potentially more embarrassing than the Reeves. This was Aristotle Onassis, the billionaire Greek shipping tycoon and playboy, who took him on numerous cruises around the Mediterranean. Onassis was a sort of swashbuckling, piratical figure but wonderfully human, uh, incredibly respectful and loving towards uh, my grandfather. I mean, he treated him uh, as he would have treated his father. Churchill now required such colorful figures to brighten the monochrome of his final years. He was extremely frail. He had several falls breaking his hip on one occasion, and spent hours sitting quietly. Depression often took hold. In October 1963, his troubled daughter Diana took her own life. For most parents, the loss of a child in this way is a catastrophe. But Churchill's near senility by this time seemed to allow him to escape once again, as his daughter Mary recalled. The lethargy of extreme old age dulls many sensibilities, and my father took in only slowly the news I had to tell him. But then he withdrew into a great and distant silence. One solace was that he remained in the House of Commons. He'd been an MP for over 60 years, and did not want to relinquish his seat at Woodford. That was the last illusion of power he had left. Yet he was no longer able to handle constituency business. In 1964, after years of bottled up frustration, his constituency party made clear that they wanted a younger MP. He was aware of a uh, personal decline. Uh, he used to say very often, how much longer do you think I've got to, to, to live? He wasn't apprehensive about it at all. He was longing for it to end. The announcement came from 28 Hyde Park Gate a few minutes ago. It said that Sir Winston died shortly after 8 o'clock this morning. The end came in January 1965. He had a bedroom on the ground floor, and there was just a, a fairly dim light by the bedside. The whole family so at one point gathered, and we knelt at his bedside. And uh, at other times, we went in individually and just sort of held his paw and gave it a squeeze. I was very grieved indeed, as I feel so many of my generation will be. His uh, inspiration is, to us during the whole of the war, I think was the thing that kept us going. The fact that he was an Englishman out and out, and there's no question about that. I mean, his doggedness and his straightforward way of going about things. The only man I ever knew that people would rush home from work to here during the war. He was a great thing for everybody, really. An awfully great man. Given his sense of history, Churchill would have felt reassured that his funeral was on a par with that of the Duke of Wellington in 1852. Rejected by the electorate in 1945, he was now embalmed as a truly national figure, above politics, the symbol of his age. After the boast of heraldry and the pomp of power, there was a simple interment at Bladen, 
near Blenheim Palace, where Churchill had been born. He was laid to rest in a plot next to his father and his mother. Lord Moran wrote later, in a country churchyard, in the stillness of a winter evening, in the presence of his family and a few friends, Winston Churchill was committed to English earth, which in his finest hour he had held inviolate. In his last summer in 1964, Churchill often sat for hours looking out from Chartwell across the Kentish Weald to Kipling's whale-backed downs. This was the view that had bewitched him ever since he bought the house. But he sat in silence. There was nothing more to say. Was he at peace with himself? I doubt it. Throughout his long life, Winston Churchill had always been in a hurry. Fearful of dying in his forties, he actually lived to his nineties. Yet he never stopped flying into the hurricane, driving full tilt into the great crises of his day. Sometimes wisely, sometimes rashly, but always making an impact. This was no recipe for a quiet life, and his family often bore the burden of Churchill's perpetual restlessness. After 1945, family life would have been easier if he'd slid into graceful retirement. His political colleagues were jostling to take his place in the limelight. But Churchill, as ever, thrived on resistance, and it drove him on to new heights. He became a two-time prime minister. Not content with his record as a war leader, he returned as would-be peacemaker. Not satisfied with his great oratory of 1940, he coined more timeless phrases like Iron Curtain, Special Relationship and United Europe. And having fought the war in deeds, he did it again in words, establishing his view of the Second World War as the verdict of history. For, as he liked to say, Words are the only things that last forever. Had he died in 1945, Churchill would still have been regarded as great. But what he did in his last 20 years cemented his reputation. Flying high and dangerously all his life, Winston Churchill found a safe landing only in history. But deep down, that's what he really wanted. And surely, in the haze of that last summer, he could already glimpse his immortality. Looking back at the rich, colourful history of the American musical, Julie Andrews begins a six-part history in Broadway tomorrow at nine. But next tonight, more on a real-life murder case that gripped America. Storyville's following it every step of the way, and tonight, new shocking evidence comes to light. Stay with us. ...brings us much closer to the human being behind the national... Churchill refused to slide gracefully into a tranquil old age. Sidelined by electoral defeat, he returned to centre stage as a world statesman. He fought his way back to the prime ministership, reinventing himself as a man of peace. And as an epic chronicler of the Second World War, 
he deliberately went about sealing his own place in history. What's more, he did all this in his 70s, punctuated by two serious strokes. Here was a man who had to keep on going because he could not stand still, whose overwhelming sense of his place in history compelled him to try to shape the future and rewrite the past, and whose furious determination to stay so long at top flying speed imposed almost unbearable strains on his whole family. If we want to understand this richly complex character, we need to look at Churchill's forgotten years after 1945. Nineteen forty five was a strange election. Hundreds of thousands of voters were far across the seas, serving with British forces in Europe and Asia. So it took three weeks from polling day until the votes were counted. During that time, Churchill remained prime minister and a commanding figure in world politics. At Potsdam, in the heart of defeated Germany, he immersed himself in the final Big Three conference of the war. Yet after a week of talks, Churchill had to return home to await the verdict of the electorate. Back in England for the election results, Mr. Churchill and his daughter arrive at a British airfield where Mrs. Churchill greets them. Conservative central office was still predicting a majority of over 80 seats. But in the early hours of Thursday the 26th of July, Churchill's confidence was abruptly shaken. Just before dawn, I woke suddenly with a sharp stab of almost physical pain. A hitherto subconscious conviction that we were beaten broke forth and dominated my mind. All the pressure of great events on and against which I had mentally so long maintained my flying speed would cease and I should fall. As the election results came in and were posted up in the war room annex, it... Ladies and gentlemen, permit me, please, to claim your attention for a moment. It can only be a moment, for as you know, we are all of us strictly rational. Throughout his life, Winston Churchill was haunted by his early experience of piloting propeller planes that could only maintain speed and height by flying into the wind. From it, he took a metaphor for living. The idea of keeping on flying against resistance inspired Churchill's ferocious will to succeed and his desperate fear of slowing down. To lose momentum, he said, is not merely to stop, but to fall. If you saved your country, arguably saved the world, what do you do for an encore? That was the question confronting Winston Churchill in the summer of 1945. You'd have thought that after his finest hour as Britain's war leader, Churchill would have rested content. But he didn't. Churchill drove on. The story, I think, is quite extraordinary. And I believe it brings... All over London, the fortress of freedom in the dark days, millions rejoice in final and complete victory after a war lasting nearly six years. On VE Day, May 1945, Winston Churchill was cheered through the streets by ecstatic Londoners. He had led his country from the brink of defeat in 1940 to total victory over Adolf Hitler. The German war is therefore at an end. 
Victory was was wonderful. But already I, I sensed a feeling of um, tremendous anxiety and foreboding. The difficulties of the post-war period began to be so enormous and they were already clouding the hour of victory. With the war over, it was back to politics as usual. In July 1945, the British people would go to the polls to elect their first post-war government. As the campaign began, it was clear that Churchill's rhetoric was out of tune with the new mood of reform. In his first election broadcast, Churchill made the astonishing claim that Labour would employ a secret police to curtail free speech. No socialist government conducting the entire life and industry of the country could afford to allow free, sharp or violently worded expressions of public discontent. They would have to fall back on some form of Gestapo, no doubt very humanely directed. In this scaremongering about a Labour Gestapo alienated many floating voters and was deeply offensive to Labour supporters. They were angry, but also they were hysterically amused by it because it was such obvious claptrap and extremely damaging to Winston to make that sort of statement. People that he was addressing and speaking to, in a sense, seemed not to be the same sort of people, people he talked to in the, in the war over the radio who were, were waiting to hear what he said and who were seeking guidance. Well, uh... Churchill even faced hecklers. Now, I dare say there are some here who are afraid to hear my word. You better listen, because you'll find it interesting. And understand that Mr. Morrison has said... Uh, ...has made a, a statement Churchill, I think, hoped that people would be grateful, as they should have been, for a great victory, and would vote, in a sense, gratefully. There's no gratitude in politics. Mm -hmm. 